educational series. Today, we have an amazing guest with us, one of the foremost global experts on the beginning of the world, the head of the Space Science Institute at Berkeley, the former head of the institute that manages the Hubble telescope. This man is literally one of the greatest brains that we could possibly access in the world of space. And I'm so excited and I feel so lucky and honored to have Professor Beck with us. Brett, Professor Beck was with us today. Thank you so much, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. What can I do for you? Well, my first question is about the recent news that's come about that there might be an alternative theory to how the universe was formed. Most people know about the Lambda Cold Fusion, 97% of the world is dark matter, which you're one of the foremost experts on. But now there's an alternative theory. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Or do you think that's absolute hogwash? Could you say what this alternative theory is? Yeah, so the, the alternative theory is that instead of dark matter, it's made up of gravitational forces. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's Morty Milgram's thing. Yeah. Nope, nope. Well, I, you know, I think that the dark matter and the dark energy are, are sufficiently mysterious that we need to remain open-minded about other explanations. I, let me just say that. I think that investigations as to whether or not the gravity, there's a problem with gravity as opposed to there being um, an actual substance or substances that we don't understand. Uh, we have to see that as a legitimate uh, means of scientific inquiry. Having said that, every test, and many of these tests are very sensitive to look for the effects of a different kind of a gravity have actually shown that the, our current idea of gravity, Einstein's general relativity, uh, theory of general relativity, is very accurate, very robust. And so I would say that the vast majority, if not almost all of, of the scientific researchers you know, it's, who, who look at this subject, uh, believe there is a dark, dark matter and a dark energy, and it's not the result of, of a, a difference in gravity. I see. And, and one of the things that have made you so famous, Professor Beckwith, is your mapping of the ancient cosmos. And such a thing would not have been able to accomplish without the funding for Hubble Telescope. Where do you see the funding for scientific research in the future? You know, is this going to be government, private, Elon Musk? I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, the, the private funding for scientific research has, has been a, a tremendous boon to science without question. I mean, places like, well, starting with Andrew Carnegie, for example. But, but currently, there are many uh, benefactors who give money to science. And especially in health sciences, this is very good. So, so we love that. We think it's great. Nevertheless, it is a pretty small portion of the funding that is provided by the federal government. There, there really isn't. The federal government, in the end, is, is much bigger than any of these private funders. And so I think without federal funding, uh, scientific research would be just a, a kind of a shadow of what it is right now. I'm, I'm optimistic about uh, continued federal funding, especially across the world. I, I, used, I lived in Europe for seven years. I, I think the Europeans have a long tradition of belief in, in research and science, uh, but also here in the United States. Regardless of which party is in power, I think that there will be, we will maintain very strong support for, for scientific research and basic scientific research. Yes, I mean, hopefully that scientific research doesn't come from the need for war. You know, my, my great uncle, uh, who I emailed you about, Sidney Benson, took part in the Manhattan Project, and such great innovation took place for such a terribly deadly purpose. And so, you know, Europe doesn't spend on their military. If Europe has to spend on their military in the future, you know, I worry that they're going to, you know, sadly, withdraw so much of the great funding that's provided for the things that CERN and many other fantastic institutions have been able to do. Well, that's a, that's a good good question. It's an interesting worry. I, I don't think that'll happen. I, I do think um, I'm not a I'm not a great supporter of war. I, I think this is a kind of a tragedy of the human condition. Oh, the worst. I will say that an enormous amount of scientific uh, advance has come from uh, funding for 
uh, or research into ways of uh, improving uh, war fighting. And this dates back a long way. You know, I, I think it's not uh, commonly known, but when Galileo uh, first crafted his, his first telescopes, which completely changed, revolutionized the science of astronomy. In fact, it made it a science. Um, what he did to secure further funding was he offered his telescopes to the Medici in Florence as a means of sighting enemy ships when they were still on the horizon and allow them to earlier prepare for war. And I think this, is all, this also goes back to the Greeks. It was fairly common for scholars when they made discoveries to immediately look at their defense applications. But that was a very tough time to be doing science. I can't remember if it was Galileo or Copernicus who ended up committing suicide in the end. I mean, you know. well, Galileo was Galileo was uh, you know he was sort of banned. He was put down by the church. He was held under house arrest for most of his life. Um, Bruno was burned at the stake for his beliefs, which were of course correct beliefs based on our modern science. Or did Copernicus convert at the end, so he didn't get burned at the stake? Did he? rescind at the last minute, I think. I think he did, yeah. No, no, I think, yeah. Um, Galileo actually recanted. He was forced to recant his views uh, publicly, although privately he still wrote about them to his daughter. Oh, very interesting. You know, I, I, a lot of my students have actually been asking me a very random question that they want me to ask you, so I, I can't let this go any forward before that. Mining on the moon, is that a realistic issue? Is that silly? Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I mean, interest in that is humongous. I can't believe it. I, I look. I don't know enough about the exact composition to know if there are things we're going to get out of the moon that we can't get out of the Earth. It will be incredibly expensive to mine on the moon. There's no doubt about that. There are some things that you will want to get at the moon or mine on the moon in order to further for, uh, further space travel. So, for example, one of the ideas of going to Mars is to first go to the moon and then use the water on the moon to create the fuel so that you can get to Mars. Because of course, once you're on the moon, the gravity is much lower, the, the demands on your spacecraft are much lighter. It's very, very much easier. So there are a lot of ideas like that bandied about. Same thing is true of actually making things on the moon or at distant planets from the materials you find there rather than trying to carry them all into space. So I think the idea of mining things on the moon to use them in situ is is a good one. Yeah. The idea that we're gonna go up there and mine, I don't know, gold and bring it back to earth, uh, I can't believe there's a value proposition there. Uh, no, I, I see your point. Speaking of mining, uh, let's talk about mining, uh, the big bang for data about today. You're someone who's written extensively about what we can learn regarding our makeup today from what happened during the big bang. How, how much of the actual human being comes from the Big Bang? Um, well, by mass, very little. Okay. Everything, right after the Big Bang, um, what was created in the early universe without stars was hydrogen and helium. And, and a little bit of lithium and some other stuff, but basically it was hydrogen and helium. Now, if you look at your body, you know, we're, we're organic creatures. Organic creatures are made up primarily of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, but all of those have hydrogens tied to them. So, and we have a lot of water in our body. So we have a lot of hydrogen atoms in our body. But the vast majority of the weight is made up by atoms like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and heavier elements. And all of those were manufactured in stars. They so you're just saying, we're, we're just an organic derivative of the planet Earth, is your point? Pretty much, yeah. Oh, huh, that's very cool. Well, I, I really enjoyed, I, I watched two of your lectures before our, our talk today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you've got an incredible, uh, you know, way of making very, very deep ideas simple to understand. Now, on that same trajectory, did you see the movie Ad Astra? No, I didn't. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting movie, and its point is that we will use the moon to get to Mars, and that by taking off from the dark side of the moon, you know, we will have a much easier time of accessing Mars. Is that, is that realistic? Does that go along with what you're talking about in terms of? It, it is realistic. It is realistic because the energy requirements to get off the moon are much less than the energy requirements to get off the Earth or even out of low Earth orbit. 
So I do think that it's, it's a good strategy. Now, having said that, I believe that SpaceX under Elon Musk, it has created a very large rocket and their purpose is to go to Mars directly and bypass the moon. And so it's a bit more of a brute force approach, but it probably, my guess is that we'll get to Mars first with those big rockets in terms of man missions or human missions then we will go into the moon. But I think NASA is talking about a moon base, which could then be used as a further staging point yes. for exploration of Mars and other parts of the solar system. If Alan offered you a free uh, ticket to go to Mars, you know, uh, due to your academic background, you know, of course you would you know, have to stay there forever. Would you accept it? I wouldn't if I had to stay there forever, no. Okay. As long as you had a round trip ticket, you would come back. Well, I'd, I'd consider a round trip ticket. I, I will tell you this. I, I think that um, I, I think space travel is very neat. I'd, I'd be I'd love to go up into space to the space station and come back. Um, I think once you get out to Mars and further, uh, what we can do auto with autonomous robots and distant probes is so remarkable. I would want to see a little bit more research being done there before we actually just spend the money to put people and bring them back. Now, you could put people and not bring them back. That would be a lot cheaper. That is not in my life plan. I, I enjoy the earth and I enjoy thinking about science. And I think it would be great if someone else wants to do that. But not. You have no moral issue though with someone willing to spend their life in Mars. You don't think there's... That one? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. No, I mean, do you, do you think we'll learn much from Mars? Do you think there's really a point in the end? I, I hate to be simplistic about it, but from a layman's point of view, what is the point of going to Mars? Is it similar to, you know, Columbus and 1492 saying, you know, let's explore? Or do you feel it's maybe more of a vague proposition? No, I think the exploration of Mars is, is a great thing. Now, is it quite the equivalent of a Columbus? I, I don't think, you know, even if I put myself back in that era, I don't think it's quite the same. We already know a tremendous amount about Mars, just from our, our rovers and our other autonomous robots and vehicles. Um, so we wouldn't go there uh, without having a pretty good idea of what we're getting into. Now, Mars had an early history which could have been much more like the Earth. A, a lot of people think that it had an early atmosphere, it might have been wet, we do see water there, but it lost it over time because it's a very low mass object. And it would be fascinating to be able to mine in Mars and take a look at core samples and see if we can understand a history which is very much maybe like the Earth. We don't know. So I think, I think that's, those are fascinating things to um, research. Uh, at the same time, we have a pretty good idea of what Mars is like right now, whereas Columbus really didn't have any idea what he was going to land on when he that's took a great off. Point. A really great point, actually, you make that, Professor. Speaking of Mars and well, Martians, there has been obviously some press about aliens recently. Do you expect that they do exist? And do you think we'll ever come across them in our lifetime? Or do you have no opinion on that? I don't think aliens are visiting Earth. I don't think that the evidence people have for aliens is credible. Now, do aliens exist? That is, do other life forms maybe like us or sentient beings like us exist in other places in the galaxy? Well, they might. There are a lot of stars and a lot of planets. We know that uh, more or less every star has, has a planetary system around it. A lot of these planetary systems have planets very much like the Earth as far as we can tell. And so there are a lot of ways that nature could have experimented in the jump from chemistry to biology and created biology on other planets. Now, the, the jump to biology happened relatively quickly on the Earth. As soon as life could have existed, it, it kind of did. It you know, really quickly to making cells that did things. But the jump, but the evolution from cells to us, to sentient beings, took about four billion years more. And that's a large fraction of the age of the universe. So I don't know if that's common. Well, so stepping, but stepping back and just, you know, looking at this from like a, a really, you know, puerile point of view, if there are so, so, so many planetary systems and galaxies and it's, you know, life is, it's binary, you either have life or death, 
the odds of life being on another planetary system almost seem impossible to not be true when you consider that there are just so many endless possibilities for either life or death. What you're doing is you're multiplying in a very large number by a very small number. Yeah. You know the large number, which is the number of planets in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. You don't know the small number, which is the probability that That's life is true. Yeah. conditions. And so it's an open question. Now, I think we might be able to answer the question of what the probability is with laboratory research. I think that the tools of modern um, microbiology and, and chemistry, are they're getting so good that I think within maybe my lifetime, we're going to see we're going to see research which will reveal the likelihood that if you have a pool of stuff, it will create life. And That's once cool. we have that number, once we have that number, then we can do exactly what you suggest. We can multiply the large number by the small number, assuming it's small. And we can see if we think there's a lot of life out there. I think until that, the only other uh, hope would be that we could detect it directly. But that's a very, very tough thing to do because even around the nearest stars, those planets are so faint and so difficult to discern that it's not clear we'll be able to create the, um, the tools, the, 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 uh, the telescopes that will allow us to really see if there's life there. Or not. How old were you when you got your first Mead telescope? Oh, uh, well, it wasn't a mead. Oh, it wasn't a mead? Oh, because I figured you're from California, so I figured it was a mead. <laughs> well, Caltech alum. Yeah, but you got to remember that when I got my first, let's see, when I got my first telescope, when, when was it? It was probably 1963 or 64. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if mead was in business then. Um, but I used to go out on our, uh, we had a, above our garage, we had a little a kind of a porch. And I used Did to you go up? where I grew up. Oh, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, wonderful. I grew up on the porch and I had a little camera uh, that I, I made a fitting for so I could take pictures through the telescope. And I took pictures of the moon and I took pictures of Venus and some of the, you know, art shots, sort of Saturn. And, and, I, and I did that, um, I, I suppose I was in middle school when I started doing that. Well, I love Wisconsin. My sister-in-law is from uh, Door County. So oh, Door County is beautiful. Yeah, it's my, one of my favorite places. Door County and Maine are my two favorite parts of the uh, United States, probably. So. Well, they're, they're beautiful states. I, I like to go back to Wisconsin every year if I can uh, to go fishing with an old high school friend. And we go up to the North Country and uh, spend a few days fishing. And it's a great time. But, you know, I, 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 I've lived all over the world. Well, I've lived in many different places. And uh, so you read the Max von Planck Institute. I mean, uh, and Heidelberg and uh, and Baltimore and and frankly, I've loved every place I lived. I found every place I've lived, I found great things. I love Baltimore. I love Heidelberg, and I love San Francisco. It's a great place to live. Plus, I like going back to Wisconsin too. Yeah. Yeah, they say places aren't boring; people are boring. So I, I believe in that. Professor, you've been a fantastic guest. I, I couldn't be more thankful uh, for your time. And I, I hope to be able to talk with you again sometime, sir. Well, you're welcome. Good luck.